Good morning. Good morning. I, I will still go ahead and say this one more time. He is a risen. You see, on this Resurrection Sunday, I pray and I believe that you have had a great Easter weekend so far. And, and I declare to us, you know, that, that is risen. And, and my prayer and my faith is that you will experience this risen Lord in every area of, of your life, in every situation, in every situation. And my prayer is... Um, and, and this is what I've been praying for you, and I, I prayed again even right now, and th that's what I'm about to pray, even as we get into the word for today, that, that you and I will experience a power that was unleashed for us when Jesus rose again from the dead. Amen. That we will know him, and the power of his resurrection. That we will walk in his purposes, that we will be those that are his ambassadors, wherever we find ourselves. And many others will come to believe in this same God that we have believed in because of the way that we live, the way that we serve, and the things that we do. You see, on this day, we remember that our Savior rose again from the dead, and he lives forevermore. He is sitting right now at the right hand of God the Father, and he lives to make intercession for you and I. And, and that brings encouragement. That, that fills me with hope. I remember there was a time, uh, you know, I was going through just a difficult situation and, uh, and, and one night I, I woke up in the middle of the night and, and I sat up in bed and I was a little bit, uh, you know, pensive and, and, and afraid, anxious. And, and in that moment, it's like I had the Lord just speak to me and say, you need to just go ahead and sleep because I live to make intercession for you. And I, I opened up the scripture and I began to read it and I began to confess it. And I said, yes, Lord, I, I will go back to sleep and I will not allow myself to be anxious or worried in any way. But I just need to pace up and down for a moment and just tell you I am grateful. And I am thankful for who you are and how you love me and how you care for me and the things that you are doing in my life that I do not even see. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning because you live to make intercession for us. And we don't need to be afraid or anxious and worried. We don't need to live in hopelessness because Jesus, you are alive and alive forevermore. And you live to make intercession for us, not, not, not from an earthly temple, but right in the Holy of Holies, in the presence of the living God. Right there at the throne of God, you make intercession for us. You seek for our good, for our blessing, for our favor. It's interesting because it's God praying for me. No wonder Stephen, on the day that he was being stoned, he saw heaven opened. And on that day, you weren't sitting, you were standing. And I believe it was to welcome him home victoriously. You care about us. You care about it. Your eyes move to and fro throughout the earth looking for the righteous. And I believe that, Lord, even right now, you're looking at us at KT Plaza, seeking to bless somebody here, seeking to encourage somebody, seeking to lift up somebody. And I praise you. And I worship you today, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I pray that as we share your word, you will speak to us so clearly. Bring forth your word. Help us to understand what you're saying. And may there be just a move and the work of your Holy Spirit in our midst today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Jesus went through, you know, say that to us, a lot of pain. You see, he was sold off by a close friend. He was talked about. He was accused falsely. He was condemned to die, forsaken by his friends. I don't know what you would do if your, friend, your friends were to forsake you and desert you and leave you all by yourself. They take off. Some of us would be so discouraged we'll not even be able to face another day. I assure you that on that night, that the, the disciples abandoned him. That night that he was arrested, things were thick. And there was no hope at all. 
he was going to die after being tortured, brutalized, and wounded deeply. You see, Friday was a hopeless situation. Our Savior was desperate and helpless. And the question I'd like to ask is, what do you do when you find yourself at that place? When, when you find yourself in, in that situation where you don't know how to move forward, what to do? How do you keep on holding and trusting and not giving up? Because our Lord and Savior did not give up. He did not quit. He did not walk away. He did not turn away. It was painful, yes. The reason why in the garden he cried, he groaned, he even got to the place where he asked the Father, you know, take this cup away. Because he knew what it was going to, to cost him, but he did not give up. And I am grateful that he did not give up. There was a time in my life, in ministry, you know, serving. I, I love ministry. I love teaching God's people to know God and to live for Him. It brings me great joy. I love seeing men and women thriving in Christ and kids growing uh, in God, knowing God and walking in God's purposes. I love to see lives transformed for God's kingdom purposes. It causes me to stay up late in the night thinking, praying, believing, trusting, causes me to get on my knees and pray. I believe that it's what God created me for. There is nothing that give, gives me pleasure and joy like just seeing lives transformed for God's purposes. People living and thriving and growing and becoming all that God desired for them. I dream about it. I visualize it. I, I trust God for it. But even though that's my passion, that's what I live for. I don't want to ever live for anything else. There, there was a time, there was a time where I was at a place, I felt like resigning, walking away from it all, not doing it again. I, I, didn't, I didn't think I would ever be able to stand on a pulpit and preach. I was so discouraged. I was hurt. I felt betrayed, gossiped on, accused of all kinds of, of, of things in ministry. And I just couldn't take it anymore. And I'll never forget that Monday. I thought about it. Picked my laptop. I actually began writing um, a letter of resign, uh, resignation. I was in a bad place. I had lost my hope in God. And I'd like to ask you that question. It's, it's not rhetorical. Allow me to just ask you again. You know, what do you do when you find yourself at such a place? Your heart hurts. Literally, your heart hurts. Your mind is constantly thinking. Your mind is on high alert. Your hopes and your dreams seem to be fading, going, dying. When your joy is gone and all you see around you is doom and gloom, what do you do when prayer does not seem to get answered? And you're struggling with pain that you cannot even be able to explain to another person. What do you do when you find yourself in such a situation? Instead of pain reducing, it increases. Instead of challenges going away, you find them multiplying. You know, have you ever been there? Anyone ever been there? I'd like to see, just, just by a show of hand, you, you, you have been there. You've been in desperate situations. Many of us, many, many of us, if I may, actually, I thought like it was everyone, but then I noticed a hand that wasn't up. Maybe the person just felt, you know what, Pastor, I'm, I'm there. You know, why are you asking? That happens, isn't it? That happens. It looks like I am in good company. Because every one of us seems to have been in that place where we've done everything that we can, but that doesn't seem to be bringing a better season, a better tomorrow. You see, there are many times when uh, not just us, but the Apostle Paul found himself in such a place. Many times when the Apostle Paul found himself in such a place. And, and there's, there's, this, there's this lie that goes around, there's this myth that goes around, that the trouble and frustration and difficulties only comes to people who have no faith. You know, 
that, that you face situations like this when you are not walking with the Lord. These are lie. These are lie. But I've come to learn. I've come to learn. And, and, and remember, we are demystifying the myths in this sermon series. I've come to learn that sometimes walking with God is when you find yourself at those desperate moments and times more often than even when you are not walking with God. That, that when you choose to go after God and God's purposes, that's when all hell seems to break loose on you. And truth is, that, that's what happens. The gates of hell come against you. The enemy wants to stop you because he doesn't want God, God's name and, and God to be glorified and honored in any way. And so he will do all that he can to try and stop you. There's this myth that says when the spirit of the living God is upon you, you're going to live encouraged, excited, hopeful in every situation. That you will not face difficulties or challenges of any kind. But I will pick Jesus. He's one of them right there in the garden of Gethsemane. He knelt and he asked, would you remove this cup from me? I, I, I can't go through with this. But I'm glad he added and said, but not my will, but your will be done. You know, that place when you don't know what else to do and you simply abandon yourself at the feet of, uh, of the Lord God Almighty and you simply say, whatever it is that you want with me, go ahead and do that. Whatever it is that you want with me, go ahead and do that. My friends, I'd, I'd, I'd like to bring us an, a word of encouragement today. And especially as we talk about the Holy Spirit and His place, His purpose and who He really is. What, what, why did Jesus say, I, I, I will not leave you like orphans. I will send you a helper. It's because he realized we needed help to be able to live on this planet. Let's look at some scriptures and you know, ask ourselves some questions. What do you do when you find yourself in a place like this? Where do you turn? Where do you go? 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'd like to begin reading from verse number 9 to verse number... 13. Verse number 9 to verse number 13. There are many other verses I would read in this chapter, but uh, uh, just because of time, I'd like to just focus on those. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 9 to verse number 13. I've said that the third time, and so we can go ahead and read the Bible. All right? Reading up on the screen, the Bible says, For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession. Like those condemned to die in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. What is he talking about? You know, we find ourselves at the end of the line. We, in other words, we are like the last people that God thinks about and, and focuses on and chooses to help. We are desperate. We are in problems. We are in challenges of all kinds. Look at this. Verse number 10. Uh, the Bible says this, we are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in drugs. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cast, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. Verse number 13, when we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I don't know whether, whether you catch the, uh, just the flow there of the words, what the man of God is saying, what this apostle is saying. Treated like the world's garbage. Have you ever seen what they do with garbage? And that's what the apostle Paul is saying. We have been treated like the world's garbage, like common trash. Going hungry, suffering in being arrested, being beaten, and not even having enough clothes. Wearing rags instead of proper clothing. How do you keep going when such situations come your way? How do you keep on praying and serving God and loving Him and loving His church when you have been treated like the scum, when you have been dishonored, disowned, denied, or, or even the support that you would need financially? He says we go without food. What do you do in such moments? How do you keep on trusting God and serving Him 
and pursuing his purpose. Because I'd like to know, this man, uh, first and foremost, just dealing with the myths here, this man, had he sinned? Had he done something wrong? Had he forsaken God for him to be saying these things? You, you see, sometimes we read the stories in the book of Acts and they don't grab us. But he's giving us a summary here. He's saying we've been arrested. We've been beaten. We've been without clothes. We've gone without food. We've been hungry. We've been persecuted. We've been called, called names. You know, we have been disowned. We've been denied. We, we have not even been supported the way that we are supposed to. Treated like the world's garbage. You see, when people pass near where garbage is, they even close their, uh, you know, try to, to just shut their noses. In other words, Paul is saying we stink in the presence of people. And it doesn't qualify and say the, the Romans or the Jews. It's, it's everyone. That, that's how they're treating us. That, that simply means even in the church. But we know for sure that this man had the Holy Spirit of God. We know that this man was called of God. Jesus himself appeared to him. That's how his ministry began. That's why he says, you know, I, I, I'm like an apostle that was born outside of the proper time of birth. Because Jesus himself picked me up and called me to be an apostle. But yet he finds himself going through all these kind of difficulties. I, I'd like to say to us, being born again, being called of God, being anointed of the, of the Lord, uh, it is not a guarantee that you will not face difficulties or pain or struggle. And so sometimes we find ourselves going through that. Sometimes we find ourselves at the place where we are actually walking in God's perfect will. At that point is where life becomes unbearable. But what do we do when we find ourselves in such a place? How, how did Paul survive? How did he make it? How did he continue to love God and to serve him and to live for him? How did he do it? And I'd like to say to us, he did it by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's by the Spirit of God he, at, at work in his life that he was able to do this. Verse number 20 of the same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I'd like us to look at verse number 20. You know, he says something here that, that is powerful, something that is profound. He points us, uh, you know, to where the, the help and the power and everything comes from. He says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk. It's not just the things that we say. It's not walking around and saying, you know, I, 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 all, all the things that people can say. And beginning to boast, you know, I'm called of God, I'm anointed of God, I, I can deal with this. That's not how you survive in, in situations that are challenging. That's how, not, not how you keep going. It's not the talk, my friend. It's not the things that people say or do not say. It, it, it does not matter what is going on around you. It's a power of God. And we know that power comes from the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said it best in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse number 8. He said to the church, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. Regardless of what is going on in your life. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's how you'll be able to do it when the power of God is at work in your life. You see, the Holy Spirit gives us the power so that we can live for God in a world that can be so painful to live in. In seasons and times when you don't know how you'll be able to face tomorrow. When friends forsake you, when those that you thought understood best and care for you forsake you, when you find yourself all alone by yourself simply because you've chosen to walk in obedience to God's leading, let me tell you something, the Holy Spirit will keep you going. His power will sustain you. He will take care of you regardless of what is going on. There is hope. Paul did not quit, he did not give up, he did not turn away. But he kept serving because the Holy Spirit was at work in his life. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're filled with hope. Even when you do not see where you're going, when it doesn't seem clear, the Holy Spirit will keep you going. He will fill you with hope. Romans chapter 15, verse number 13. Romans 15, verse number 13. 
It's an interesting scripture. I read this scripture many years ago. And I've never forgotten the words and just the way that it rings so powerfully in my life. Are you there? Romans chapter 15 verse number 13. Up on the screen the Bible says, May the God of hope, that's where it comes from. He's the God of hope. He's the God of hope. He's the one who sustains us when we feel like quitting, running away, turning back, not continuing on. He's the God of hope. May that God, the God of hope that you have come to believe and trust in, may He fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the reason Jesus told the disciples, tarry ye in Jerusalem. Because when they face the storms and challenges, when the Romans rise up against them, when the Jews want to kill them, when, when all kinds of persecution breaks out, this is how they will survive. The God of hope will fill them or cause them to abound or overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray today that you would overflow with hope. That you will begin to see beyond the situations that are around you. That you will begin to see beyond your failures. You will begin to see beyond your frustrations. You will begin to see beyond your disappointments, beyond your fears. And begin to soar up and overflow with hope. And become contagious even to the people that are around you. Because my friend, when you hold on to hope, the Bible says hope does not disappoint. Allow me to say this to us. This is a good statement you can write down. Allow me to say this to us. With the Holy Spirit, we have power to live our lives with hope. Filled with hope. But without Him, we live based on our failures, our fears, and our frustrations. With the Holy Spirit, we have power to live our lives with hope. But without Him, we live based on our failures, our fears, and our frustrations. Allow me to just say it one last time. With the Holy Spirit, we have power to live our lives with hope. I can stop there and that statement is full and it's true completely. But without Him, without the Holy Spirit, we live based on our failures, our fears and our frustrations. We make decisions. For example, you find somebody making a decision based on their fears. You find people making decisions based on their failures. I will never do this again. I will never walk on this road again. I, I will never live my life again this way. In fact, we get to the place where something that I, I was learning and dealing with this past week, we come to the place where we begin to make it, you know, inner vows. We make inner vows that, that become so strong in the, way, in the way that they control our lives. Because of something that you've gone through, a failure or a fear or a frustration that you've faced in, in times past, you say, I will never do one, two, three again. Maybe you're a... You're, you're a lady and you've come to the place where, you know, somebody l l claimed to have loved you or cared for you and then at some point they used you and then dumped you and moved on. And, and, and you simply say, I will never allow a man to control my life like this ever again. And several years later, God brings somebody your way. But you still have a wall that you have put up, a vow that you have vowed and you refuse completely to open your life to this person, regardless of what they do. Simply because you, you lived your life based on a fear, based on a failure, based on a frustration. We do that all the time. Come to the place of saying, you know, I, I, I will never live in, in poverty like this ever again. Uh, you, you know, and, and, and you begin to live and, and do things in such a way that even God's word cannot reach out to you. Because you're determined. You will never live in poverty again. And so you're willing to do anything to keep a job or get a contract, you know, even if it means bribing or whatever it is. And it doesn't matter what God's word says. There's a vow that begins to cause you to go in a direction. We tend to live our lives based situations. You go through a difficult situation and you decide, I will not go that, 
down that road again. I, I, I will not be faithful in seeking and trusting God. I did and he let me down. He disappointed me. Look at the way I'm, I'm hard. These things I am done. It's the reason why you find people serve God. Then they begin to serve. They begin to walk in ministry. When, when they are born again, several years later, they are nowhere. You don't see them in ministry. They come to ICC Mombasa because they have come to the city of Mombasa. Maybe they even re rededicate their lives to Christ in this church. But they can't serve. It doesn't matter what you say. They never get to serve. They are always seated. Why? Because five years ago, they were hurt in a church somewhere. They were hurt by a pastor. They had a story. And, and, and that's it. I am saying to us today, we need to stop living our lives based on our failures, our fears and our frustrations and let the Holy Spirit come and begin to lift us and begin to fill us with hope so that we can overflow with hope. When we begin to overflow with hope, it doesn't matter what you yesterday say, you are focused on what lies ahead. That's how Jesus lived. That's how the Apostle Paul lived. That's how everyone in the Bible lived. And I call us to that place. The Bible says... The room may run this, uh, read this race with perseverance. Why perseverance? Because it's a difficult world. In this world, you will have trouble, Jesus said. But how did he survive? The Bible tells us, same verse, Romans chapter 12, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. That's how you keep on running. That's how you keep on running. That's how you keep on going, my friend. I stand here today and I say, don't let your fears become the determinant of how your life goes. Don't let your frustrations become that which is a barrier that stops you from going where God wants you to go. Don't let your frustrations, what you're facing today, what you're seeing, stop you from living for the living God. All hell might have broken loose over your life, but there is a power greater than any frustration, any failure, and any fear that will lift you up and cause you to hope in God and keep on going. And you can declare like like our Lord and Savior and say it's not my will but yours be done because you begin to overflow with hope and go with God where he wants you to go Amen. you see hope helps us to keep on going even when everything around us is doom and gloom with hope we continue working we continue pushing we continue moving and we do not see the limitations and the difficulties, but we see the joys and the victories. We remember the celebrations with hope. With hope. The I can't disappears. And you and I can live in the I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Is what Paul declared to the Philippians. I can do all things. And that statement was not made at the point where he was excited because all of all the good things that were happening in his life. In fact, when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, he was saying, I've learned in every situation whether I have much or have little. Whether I'm in trouble or I'm enjoying peace. Whether I'm going through difficulties and frustrations and challenges. Or I'm enjoying victories and favor and, and, and God's leading. I have learned how to live in every situation. How did he learn how to live? He was overflowing with hope regardless of what is going on. Even when he was in the middle of a shipwreck situation. The Bible says... Uh, of the Apostle Paul, he told the people he was with, we need to eat because we will not die, we will survive. And there's a storm raging around them. Everyone is afraid, people are sure they're going to die. And the man dares to say, we will not. We will not. Amen? That's how you survive, that's how you keep going. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That is what hope does. That hope comes from the Holy Spirit. You know, he does that in our lives. He gives us the power to hope. Hope says that we can. Hope says that we will live. Hope says that we will win. Hope says that we will not give up. We'll keep on going forward. I don't know what you're facing today or what you're going through. Or what has come against you. But I know this. I know this. That the Holy Spirit of God is available to empower you and fill you with hope. Amen? Amen? Would you look at the person next to you and tell them the Holy Spirit is available to cause you to abound in hope?
bring you to that place where you are overflowing. That's what he wanted to do. He wants to cause us to overflow in hope. Because your frustrations cannot stop you. Your pain cannot kill you. Your failures cannot derail you. And your fears cannot scare you. You need to hope in God and keep going where God desires you to go. You see, with the Holy Spirit upon him. Because we know when he was anointed by the, by the prophet Samuel, the Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him. With the Holy Spirit upon him, David showed up at the battleground. He showed up at the battleground. Everyone else is running away from Goliath. But he looks at Goliath and he says, I can take him out. I can take him out. You know, and, and he asked the king, and I'm paraphrasing here. You know, he asked the king, let me lose. I'll take this guy. It doesn't matter. The king said, he's a man of war. You are just a boy. He said, it doesn't matter. You have no idea what I've got. I know that I can be able to take him. And sure enough, he took him out. When everyone else was running away from the giant, David was running towards the giant. He said, I'll go down that valley. I'll meet with him down there. I know that I can be able to deal with this situation. Everyone else was hopeless. The man was filled with hope. And he believed that he could be able to do it. And I believe it's because of the Holy Spirit of God that was upon him. It's the reason why he believed that a giant can die. You see, the Holy Spirit wants to give you hope like that. So that you may see, you may hear, and you may keep going where he wants you to go. That's what I'm talking about. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, he gives you power to live your life for him. Filled with hope. Empowered by hope. Empowered by hope. If I was to stop this someone right here, it will still be okay. Because I believe that right now you're lifting up your eyes beyond your circumstances and beyond your situations. And you're beginning to see the things that God desires of you. The things that God has for you. The things that God called you to. The things that God desires to do and accomplish in you and for you. It's how I survived. It's how I kept going. It, it, it's why I'm here today. Because of the Holy Spirit of God. Who at some point in the course of that day, as I felt like giving up and walking away and, and, just, and just not pursuing the things that I'm so passionate about. I had the Holy Spirit beginning to speak to me. And he began opening my eyes and showing me all of the work that still he wanted me to do. And hope began to be born again in my life like a little seedling beginning to grow. I began to hope again. I began to trust again. And over the years, I've come to learn that I don't need to trust in my strength, in my abilities, or anything like that. That I, All I need to do is trust that He will lead me. Trust that He will take care of me. Trust that He will guide me. And trust that He will work in me to accomplish His purposes. Last week, I told you the story of the lady that came and sat down in my office. <laughs> And she began to share with me her life story. And just how she got transformed and changed in this life. Was living in the city of Mombasa. Came to live here. Because she came and got married to another lady. They were lesbians. They had always been uh, from the time that she was in primary school. In fact, she says for as long as she remembers, she was always attracted and played with, uh, with girls. When girls were thinking about boys and boys were thinking about girls, she was thinking about girls. But then she told me she came to this church. And her life was completely changed and transformed. And today she is born again, loves God. The, the, the whole lesbian thing has been broken completely. And she has been set free. The, the part that I didn't tell you was that day I had prayed. I told the Lord, let, let me just see that you're still at work in my ministry. That you're still with me. That you're still leading. That you're still guiding me. And that testimony blew my soul off. I was like, Lord, I will keep serving. I will keep serving. And she told me, Pastor, I have been inviting any, any lesbian I meet out there because I know the places where they used to hang and all. I, 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 I don't get into arguments with them. I just tell them, show up at ISIS in Mombasa. And some of them look at me and they say, you know, are we welcome in church? She says, yes, I know a church where you're welcome. It doesn't matter, just show up. Just show up. And how keep serving this God who breaks the yoke of sin, who sets people free, who delivers. 
this God who forgives sin and redeems and draws people to himself, I will serve him all the days of my life. And in the same hope that he fills me with, I know he will continue to fill many others with that same hope. And I will hold on till I see the fullness of God's purposes in this city. And she's not the only one. And that's not the only thing that God has done. I have seen God deliver, set free, heal, and perform all kinds of miracles. And, and I'll continue to hold on. Because with the Holy Spirit, I have the power to live my life filled with hope. That I don't quit, I keep going, I keep loving, I keep serving, I keep believing, and I keep trusting with the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. That you will be at work in your life, that it will fill you with hope. Because the Holy Spirit did not just come so that you and I would speak in tongues. He came so that we would be filled with hope. When you're feeling as though you've come to the end, that your business cannot survive another day. When you're looking at the debts and the things and the bills that you need to deal with. When you're looking at how things are going with your children, maybe at your workplace, maybe with your friends, your family. That instead of quitting and running away and giving up, you will hold on. You will trust. You will let God lead you and guide you and take you forward. That you will not quit before your time. That you will serve God and you will love God. And you will stay where God desires if you are praying today. That you may be filled with the Holy Spirit. God, because God has a plan and a purpose for your life. The prophet Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 29 verse number 11. And he said, God speaking, for I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of good and not of evil to give you a future and to give you a hope. That, that's a plan of God. That's a plan of God. So that you may continue living. You may continue serving and loving and, and living your life fully for his kingdom purposes. And that hope comes from the Holy Spirit. It's the reason why Jesus said, I will not leave you like orphans. You see orphans. And I say this, knowing that some of you here have been there. You know, who do you call when other boys your age are harassing and fighting against you? Where do you turn when you've been chased away from mom to turn to? What do you do when challenges of all kinds come against you? My friends, we were never meant to live our lives that way. As Christians, as believers, the Holy Spirit is available. That in your hopelessness, in your struggles, in your challenges, you can lift up your eyes to him and say, I need you. I need your help. I need your guidance. I need your wisdom. He is our counselor. He is our teacher. He is our helper. We can live in hope because we have him. And so how do we get to that place? Number one, three things very quickly. Very simple things. Nothing profound. Because I believe the profoundness of this sermon is not in my words, but is in the power of the Holy Spirit as it begins to work his hope in your life. The first one is simply this. You and I have got to stop living by our fears, failures, and frustrations. We've got to stop. That, that needs to, to, to come to an end. Right here, right now, today. You've got to stop living by your fears, your failures, and your frustrations. These three thieves, they tend to rob us of all that God has for us. They keep us from experiencing the power that God wants to release upon our lives. Our failures do not define us. Our fears do not rule over us. And our frustrations are not our focus. Allow me to say that again. Our failures do not define us. Our fears do not rule over us and our frustrations are not our focus. We need to stop giving these things the power to shape our destiny and let only God shape our destiny. We've got to stop letting what is going on around us, what we have gone through, dictate to us what we can or cannot do. Only God should do that. Only God should have the power to dictate what should go on in our lives. He's our dream giver. He's our destiny maker. He's our source of life, of hope, and of every good thing. And so we need to stop letting these things, these fears, these failures, these frustrations control our lives. We need to stop. We need to stop. And number two, I told you, there's nothing profound about these points. I pray that you will pick them up in the simplicity. 
and just come to the place of saying, I stop today, I stop. I will not look at what is going on in my life and let that dictate how I should live my life. No way. No way. I will not look at what is going on or what is not going on and let that control me. I will not let what I'm afraid of begin to dictate how I'm going to live. I'm not going to let my failures. Because you're not defined by your failures. You're not who you are yesterday. You're who you are. Uh, you are who God is making you to be, who He's building, who He's guiding and leading forward. Let the dream giver give you a new dream. Let the destiny maker make your destiny. Let the source of your life give you life and give it to you in abundance. Number two, lift up your eyes. We've got to lift up our eyes to the Holy Spirit. We've got to lift up our eyes to the Holy Spirit. We've got to see what the Spirit of God is showing us. Hear what the Spirit is saying and go after what the Spirit is nudging us to go after. He told Philip the evangelist, get onto that chariot. And when Philip got onto the chariot, you know, Philip the evangelist, he met the Ethiopian eunuch. He was able to explain the gospel to him. And church history says there were a lot of believers in, in the nation of Ethiopia simply because of, it, of this Ethiopian eunuch. Philip might have never set foot in Ethiopia, never stepped in there. But because he had the voice, the nudging, the leading of the Holy Spirit, he was able to lead a certain eunuch to the Lord. And because he was able to do that, many others after him came to believe in this Jesus and, and trust him and walk in him. You and I need to be a people that hear what the Spirit of God is saying, see what he's showing us and go along with the nudging, with the leading, with the guidance that he brings our way. The Holy Spirit showed John, the Apostle, the revelation that you and I call the book of Revelation. And until today, we still continue to marvel at the accuracy of those prophetic words. Just the accuracy of those prophetic words. One of the things that I love doing is reading the book of Revelation. And then reading what, how people have tried to interpret it in times past. And then look at what is going on today. And what amazes me is just how precise, just how precise John was. Are, are, are you with me? Just how precise John was. In times past, people have tried to project and maybe try, you know, like I remember in the early uh, 90s, late 80s, people were talking about how, you know, the, the two prophets that are talked about in the book of Revelation will die on the streets of Jerusalem and they will be watched by, by, by the whole world. And they began talking, uh, you know, and, and pastors and other teachers uh, would, would talk about how satellite can be able to do that. But then they would say, you know, uh, it, it, there will need to be a headquarters of a major TV station in the nation of Israel so that when that happens, they will have their cameras right there and then they will beam this with satellite, uh, you know, and, and then they used to debate. They, they, they used to get trouble with the, with, with the whole phrase at the same time. And they were like, how can this happen? And satellite normally has a lag. And so they, they, they said, well, there will be advancement in satellite and all. But you look at it today and you're like, my goodness, it's not even satellite. Today it can happen even without a media station. All you need is somebody on the streets of Jerusalem with a smartphone. And all they will do is get on Facebook Live or YouTube Live or Twitter Live because every social media these days is going live. WhatsApp, whatever. And they'll be able to stream in, but I think we've not even seen anything yet. Because I don't think we are right at the end. There are still a few years remaining. I can, if I was to get into a very simple verse that will help you understand that. There's still about 11,000 unreached people groups on planet Earth. And yet Jesus said very clearly, And this gospel of the kingdom shall, shall first be preached unto every nation as a witness, then the end shall come. And so we are not there yet. As long as those 11,000 have not had a gospel, there is no witness among them, the end is not here. We need to serve the Lord and do all that He desires of us to do. Amen? 
Yeah, we've got to go by the accuracy of scripture. People used to debate how chips will be put in our skins and all. I don't think anyone will ever be put a chip in the skin. That technology is outdated. It's too old. There are easier ways. I'll not get into that. There are easier ways of tracking you and giving you a number. And remember, it's a number of money. And it's an economic number. That's a clue we have. It's not a government number. It's an economic number. You will not be able to buy or sell without it. Not because of government control, but because of economic control. Just the accuracy. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Now, when John got the revelation, it wasn't in the best seasons of his life. In fact, church tradition says he was in the island of Patmos where he had been put as a slave because they had tried to kill him with all other kinds of ways. They had tried to boil him in, in, in oil and he didn't die. They had stoned him, he didn't die. They had removed his eyes and then they put him on the island of Patmos where he, he was supposed to you know, hew stones together with other prisoners that were being used to build the roads for the Roman uh, Empire and, and, and build their buildings and all. And right there is where, without eyes, this man was able to see even things that are happening in our day and things that will happen in the days to come. And when you read through the book of Revelation, there's no hint of complaint. There's no hint of grumbling or hopelessness. We see a man writing of the greatness of God and knowing that God is really who he says he is. I pray that you will live your life like that. That even if people remove your eyes, you will still continue to see. That even if your ears be cut off and blocked, you will continue to hear. And you will continue to go forward with the Lord leading you, the Lord guiding you. You will continue to do the things that God wants you to do. If God called you to be a business person, you will continue to run that business. And it doesn't matter what is going on with the economy. You will not quit. You will not give up. That if God led you to that workplace, regardless of what names you've been called and what your boss has tried to do, my friend, you will stick in there and you will let the Lord himself give you the victory. Because if he called you there, victory is coming. And there is a day coming when my God will show up. And when he shows up, everyone shall know that you are have trusted and believed and hoped in the God who made the heavens and the earth, the Almighty One who cannot be shaken by the circumstances that come against you. My God is a God who gives victory. Lift up your eyes and let Him be the one that works in you. My friend, don't leave complaining. Don't let the criticism affect you or hinder you. Oh, I call you today. My friend, stop looking around and listening to the gossip and hearing and, and, and the things that others might be saying against you. Oh no, you need to hear the Holy Spirit. You need to let him be the one that speaks to you. The Bible says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's possible. It's possible with criticism and complaining and listening to everything else that is going on. It's possible to quench the Holy Spirit. But I call you today, my friend, to heed the word of the Lord and do not quench the spirit of the sovereign God. Let him fill you. Let him lead you. Let him lift you. Let him guide you. Let him take you where God wants you to go. Oh yes, lift up your eyes to him. And when you do so, he will fill you. He will give you the power. He will guide you into the fullness of all that God desires of you. And lastly, I say to us, number three, go forward. <laughs> go forward. Don't quit, don't give up, don't give in, but go on. Go forward. The Holy Spirit will never come upon you if you do not ask him. He will not guide you if you do not let him. He will not help you if you do not need him. I, I think that's profound. I need to say it again. The Holy Spirit will never come upon you if you do not ask him. He will not guide you if you do not let him. And he will not help you if you do not need him. He is available, but we can quench him. We can stop him. We can push him away. And the only way to avoid this is to go forward with him. Follow his lead. Let him fill you with hope. Let him take you into all that God has for you. And you will find yourself almost, you know, when you find yourself almost giving up, he will, he will lift you up. He will raise the standard. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the floods will come. 
the floods will come. But when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Bible says God will raise a standard by His Spirit. He will raise a standard by His Spirit. He will raise a standard. For sure. Let me say that again. He will raise a standard by His Spirit. Amen? And so don't be worried about the floods that are coming. Don't be anxious about the things that are going on in your life. Let the Spirit of God raise a standard for you. I am still here. I'm still preaching. I'm still going forward. I'm still serving because of the Holy Spirit. And I'll continue to do so because I know, I know He will lead me till the day that I lay down in death. I am His disciple. I'm His servant. My eyes are on Him. And like Paul and Silas, I will sing in the prison till the doors are opened. And I call you to do the same. Rather than be in the prison crying and mourning and grumbling and complaining, just sit in there and begin to lift up a praise to the Lord. May the Spirit of God fill you with hope today. May He fill you with hope today. May He cause you to begin to glorify Jesus wherever you go. And as you do so, as you walk in hope, as you lift up the name of Jesus, I know that the Spirit of God, by His power, will open the prisons. And not so that you may run away out of there, but so that others may come in and begin to see, and begin to hear, and begin to know how you survived. That they may hope in the same God and trust in the same God. Oh, may you overflow with hope today by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, I pray that these men and women, myself included, that will overflow with hope by the power of your Holy Spirit. That that hope will flow and begin to infect and to touch and to change everyone around us. Just like Paul and Silas in prison, as they lifted up their eyes to you and began to sing in hope and praise, the rest of the prisoners were listening in. And made that day, I believe, many were transformed. And, and, and the Bible tells us of the jailer that came together with his family. And they found the prison doors open, but in there, they had never realized that they were living in prison because they had never come to know you. And that day they got to know you. I pray that as we walk through this life, as we go through, regardless of the things that we have been facing, as we begin to live in hope by the power of your Holy Spirit, that will bring hope wherever we go. In our workplaces, in our homes, oh God, will bring hope, my Father, in the streets of this city, will bring hope wherever we go, my God. It will begin to overflow because your Spirit is upon us, every one of us. I pray that you may fill us with your Spirit today. I pray, my God, you may help us to follow your lead. I pray that you may help us to lift up our eyes to you. I pray that you may help us to stop listening to our fears, our failures, and our frustrations. And as we trust in you, as we hope in you, I pray that you will change our circumstances and situations and we will walk in the victory that is ours. I pray today that you will raise a standard by your spirit, my God. Again, it's every flood that has come up against my brothers and sisters. May our lives be different. May we live by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. As you're praying, I'd like to ask as I conclude. You're here. And there is a desperateness, a desire, a longing to walk in God's purposes and God's ways. But the hopelessness, the frustration, the disappointment have been so great. And today you're saying, I need the Holy Spirit. Pray with me, Pastor. I think I've quenched the Spirit. I think I, I, I've lived in such a way that I've pushed Him away. But today, pray with me. I want the Holy Spirit to come upon me. Raise up your hand. Let me pray together with you even before I release us. Heavenly Father, I pray with the men and women that are lifting up their hands right now, right across this room. I don't know what the situation is or what they're going through, but I pray, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, would you come upon them? Would you come and fill them? Would you come and take over their lives? Would you come and fill them with hope and cause them to overflow with the same? I pray that you may come and raise a standard against every situation that they are facing, every pain, every challenge that they are going through. Raise a standard and help them. Help them to hear what you're saying. Help them to see what you want them to see. Help them to go where you want them to go. That they will not necessarily focus on hearing what everyone else is hearing. They will not focus on seeing what everyone else is seeing. They will not focus on going where everyone else is going. They will begin to let you lead them, Holy Spirit. They will begin to let you guide them. They will begin to let you take them where you want them to go. My God, it's my prayer today that these men and women will hear what you want them to hear. They will see what you want them to see. And they will go with you where you're leading them. May they go into the fullness of your calling, into the fullness of your grace, into the fullness of your working for their lives. For I pray today, Holy Spirit, come upon them in Jesus' name.
in Jesus' name.